Well, welcome everyone to our discussion today and our presentation that results from a benchmark study we just completed on lead generation. The title for our session today is Lead Generation, Fueling the Revenue Engine. And we are happy to say that this research and presentation was sponsored by Sales Fusion. A couple of logistical details I want to take care of here at the beginning of our presentation. Uh, one is we are recording our presentation. So if you want to watch it again or you want to share it with someone, you'll be able to do that. Uh, within a few days of the completion of our presentation, we'll have an email that will go out. It will contain the link to the recording. It will also have a link to a PDF version of the slides. So you'll get both the slides and the recording. You'll also get a copy of this report if you attended today or if you participated in the survey that produced the data for this report. So that's one. The other logistical detail is I really want questions. So hopefully as we go through the information I'm going to present to you today, it isn't just me doing all the talking, uh, but it's you also submitting your questions. If you will take a look at your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see there is an area for questions. And anytime during your presentation, I invite you to submit a question or a comment. When we get to the end, I'll have a chance to review those and address those, we'll go through the questions that we get. So please ask questions. Let me know what's on your mind as we go through this information. Very quickly, our agenda is, I'm gonna cover the background for the study, what we found out, some of the conclusions that we've drawn from this data on lead generation, as well as some next steps you can take. And then of course, as I just mentioned, I welcome your questions, so submit those anytime. There's also a hashtag on the screen and we encourage you to continue the dialogue on this topic outside of our presentation today. If you want to tweet or post or, or anything else related to social media, we recommend that you use the hashtag LeadGen to do that so we can all participate in that conversation a little bit more easily. So with that, let me now provide uh, an important announcement, and that is the winner of the iPad Mini. You may recall if you participated in the survey, that we offered as an incentive a prize drawing, a random prize drawing, and I'm pleased to announce that Barb with OSF Healthcare is the lucky winner of that iPad Mini. And Barb, I think you're on our call today, so congratulations to you. I hope you enjoy using that iPad Mini. And someone will get with you after the call to help you find out how to get that. So let me introduce today's presenter, which is myself. Uh, I'm Jerry Rackley, the Chief Analyst here at Demand Metric, and I am the person who led the research for this study, uh, did the analysis as well as wrote the report, which is the basis for everything I'm presenting to you today. So if you have questions, hopefully I can answer them. Let's talk also for a minute about our study sponsor. Sales Fusion is the company that sponsored both the research as well as today's broadcast. We're grateful to our sponsor companies for underwriting the research that we do. We think that our members get a lot of benefit from what we find out in these studies. So Sales Fusion has a website that's listed on the screen. They really provide a complete marketing funnel management solution. And if that's something that you need to do, in fact, even as we go through today's presentation, you may become aware of the need for a solution like this. I encourage you to check out what they have to offer. I also want to thank everyone who participated in our survey. I realize that here at Demand Metric, we send out a lot of requests for participation in surveys. You've probably seen several emails. We are very grateful for those of you who take the time to respond because it gives us the data to have discussions like we're having today. So let's talk about why lead generation is so important. Uh, leads are the fuel for the revenue engine. There's just no question about that. Um, it's, it's important because most organizations tell us they have a lead generation process. In fact, just 11% in this study claimed they didn't have one. However, just 9% of the people who have one said that their process was highly effective. So this lead generation process is in the critical path to revenue. And it accounts for a pretty significant chunk of marketing's budget and marketing's resources. So it's obviously very important for those reasons. And the performance of the lead generation process is usually one of the greatest single points of friction between sales and the marketing teams. So most organizations, as the study sort of reveals, tell us there's room for improvement. So it's a really important process. It fuels the revenue engine and, and we need to pay perhaps more attention to it than we have. 
let me give you a bit of background on the study. Uh, the study was driven by the research question you see on your screen. And it's a very simple one. And that's just how are marketers doing lead generation? We wanted to understand that. But of course, underneath that, there were lots of other questions that we wanted to ask as well. And you see those on the screen. How well is the process working? And how are leads being captured and stored? And what's the overall performance of the process? How's it being measured? What sort of changes would help it the most? Uh, what kind of investment is going to occur? Where's the change of emphasis going to be in the future on lead generation? So these are all the things that we wanted to pursue in this study. And I think we got a really good set of data to help us understand these things. Uh, a few definitions first, just to make sure we're all operating on the same level of understanding. First, a lead is very simply defined as a potential sales contact. The next would be a qualified lead, which is a lead for which there's some evidence of readiness to buy. Then of course there's lead generation, which is the process of generating new leads. And finally, a related process, because if you talk about lead generation, you can't not talk about lead nurturing, which is the process of shepherding existing leads through the sales cycle. And as we probably all suspect, and certainly as the study shows, the process formality, the definitions uh, and effectiveness can vary greatly from company to company. So before we jump into some of the findings, let me just share with you some of what we call the categorization data, the buckets that we used, the buckets of data to help us kind of do the analysis and slice and dice a little bit. So in terms of role, you can see that over two thirds of the people who participated in our study were from the marketing team. Uh, we also had a large percentage, uh, over three quarters, who were in B2B companies. And in terms of sales, uh, it was across the board. Uh, we had companies, both large, medium, and small, pretty well represented in the sample. So that gives you a feel. And by the way, all of the detail of anything I'm presenting to you today is found in the study report that we'll publish, if not later this week, next week. So with that sort of background and setup, let's go into what we found out when we did this particular study. A lot of times when we do these studies, we'll kick the survey off with a what I would call a warm-up question, but it's still a very important question. In this case, we asked about lead generation process effectiveness. And what you see here on the chart is that only 9% of the study participants said their process is highly effective. But on the good news side, almost half reported that it's moderately or highly effective. We know that we look at this and say the assessment is subjective, and it is, because when we asked this question, we didn't provide any criteria to guide participants in rating their process effectiveness. We just wanted sort of their, their intuition on how well the process works. For most companies, lead generation effectiveness is a function of both quantity and quality. So we'll explore both of those dimensions of lead generation effectiveness as we continue through our presentation. We ask next about how you're generating leads. What approaches are you using? And as you can see from this chart, which ranks from top to bottom, the frequency of these uses or approaches, email continues to be the workhorse of lead generation efforts. Probably not a surprise to anyone. Later in this presentation, we'll review some data that shows which areas are targeted for greater investment and for less investment. So for now, Let's make some observations about what else this data tells us when we do further analysis, which, which we did. So one of the things we discovered, when you look at the top three approaches, which were email marketing, trade show event marketing, and content marketing, those three approaches are constant regardless of company size. And in fact, the order of popularity for all of the approaches doesn't really change much, if at all, for companies that are experiencing either revenue growth or they're experiencing flat or declining revenue. And likewise, um, what we also discovered is that participants that assess their process effectiveness, their lead generation process effectiveness as very or slightly ineffective are using the same approaches uh, with about the same frequency as those who are on the opposite end of the effectiveness scale. So 
the question this has to, to force us to ask is if everyone is essentially using the same lead generation approaches, regardless of uh, process effectiveness of company size or, or other factors, why are some having success and others are not? If the approaches are the same, the only variables remaining are frequency and sophistication. The logical conclusion is that the issue with effectiveness is not a function of the approach that's being used, but more how the approach is executed. And we feel that it's a quality issue. So let's now look at lead capture and storage. That's pretty important at the front end of the lead generation process to get leads captured. Uh, that's the goal of lead gen, is to capture a lead for subsequent use, typically nurturing and then conversion. And despite lots of technology that can assist in lead capture, it, it seems, based on the data, that a fair amount of leads are captured using very low techniques. To find out how leads are captured, we presented the options you see in this chart to our study participants. And let me give you the descriptions really quickly, just to make sure everyone has the same understanding here. A web form is typically something that's on a landing page that a lead is directed to through some sort of offer. And as we saw on a previous slide, often that comes through email. Data entry is a process of manually entering lead information into whatever system is used to store them. List import is when we acquire lists from some external source and a typical place would be a trade show or an event. And, and then we import them. Integration is direct integration between a lead capture point such as a landing page and the systems in which leads are stored. And most often those tend to be CRM or marketing automation systems. And then there's social media where we harvest leads straight out of social media posts and comments, likes, or follows. So these are all ways leads are being captured. You can see the frequency here. Number one on the list, of course, is web form. Most organizations uh, on, on this particular study are using multiple methods to capture leads. 80%, in fact, uh, are using at least two of the methods that we presented on the previous slide as response options. They're using at least two of those methods to capture leads, and one-third of our study participants are using three of those methods. So as we see channels for lead generation continue to expand, using multiple capture methods is, methods is just going to become even more important than it has been. Uh, and I did mention already a third of our study participants are using three methods. So very common to see multiple methods being used. Now, what about where these leads are going? Capturing leads is just the first stage of the process of nurturing and ultimately converting leads. And where leads are stored has a lot to do with how consistently the nurturing process works. Think about what a lead is. It's a pretty simple collection of information, very easily stored in a variety of systems, including hard copy. The problem when leads are stored in places or in systems that aren't specifically designed for managing leads is that they are not uniformly nurtured. It's really far too easy for leads to fall through the cracks. And I think we in marketing have all heard that term, fall through the cracks when it comes to leads, when they end up being stored in places like spreadsheets or email folders. So CRM and marketing automation systems are designed to house leads and they provide tools and automation to make sure leads make it to the sales team. And furthermore, these systems are designed to track and report on the status of the leads that are stored in those systems. Here's some more data about these systems I think is important. Participants in this study report that using CRM or marketing automation systems as the primary repository for leads, they rate their lead generation processes as moderately or highly effective 59% of the time. And that compares to just 49% of the time for the full survey sample. So hopefully that, that makes sense to you. In other words, they, if you're using these systems, you're reporting higher effectiveness in terms of overall process. So, so we think that systems then are very important in this whole discussion of leads. Now let's look at how the process is performing. Over half the organizations in this study report that their lead generation process doesn't produce enough leads. And you can see the breakdown here on this particular chart. 
Um, 58% say not enough leads. It's tempting to dismiss these lead volume results as just part of the constant refrain that we in marketing get from the sales team demanding more leads. However, two thirds of the study participants were marketers, not salespeople. So over half of which are essentially admitting that their process doesn't produce enough leads. Other processes should come into play when we're talking about lead volume and an important one would be customer retention. There's also the effectiveness of the lead nurturing process to consider. And this isn't a study on lead nurturing, but as I said at the beginning, I don't think you can talk about lead gen and not also talk about lead nurturing. Is marketing required to generate leads of such high quality that little in the way of sales effort is needed to convert them? Lead generation volume is not a metric to consider in isolation. So just generating more leads is not the cure to flaws that may exist in the sales process. And in fact, I would say this, an overemphasis on quantity can enable or disguise critical process flaws in other areas like nurturing or sales. But with that said, the process still must generate an adequate number of leads and more participants in this study say it does not than say it does. The other side of this lead generation process performance coin is quality. And here we see 85% of study participants rate lead quality as moderate to very high. So that actually looks pretty good. In any process, there's room for improvement. We know that. And that need was apparent when considering the volume of leads generated by most organizations in our study. Conceptually, it is ideal if lead quality is at the highest possible level. But let's be realistic. There is a point of diminishing returns when too much is invested trying to get it to the highest possible level. If the supporting processes are working as they should, and lead nurturing in particular, the need to consistently produce high quality leads becomes less important. Moderate quality leads are probably really what an effective lead gen process should produce, assuming, of course, the surrounding supporting processes are in place and working well. If an organization has the right systems in place, and, and right systems often mean CRM and marketing automation, it doesn't need to overinvest in producing consistently high quality leads at the expense of related and equally important processes. So that's my take on, on quality. I think it's really important to also take a look at this next issue of, is there a definition? Yeah, and we know that assessing lead quality is often very subjective. It's, it's sort of in the eyes of the beholder. You talk to someone in marketing, they'll have one definition. You talk to someone in sales, they'll have a different one. Uh, and that's probably where these SQL and MQL definitions came from. But even within the same organization, what the marketing team considers high quality is likely to differ, perhaps even substantially, from the sales team's definition. And in our study, over one-fourth of the participants have no lead quality standard or definition in place. And this is a problem. This is a recipe for trouble. Organizations that are more mature in their lead gen processes and efforts do have lead quality definitions in place. And they're often formalized with agreements between marketing and sales. Having a standard or definition in place for lead quality is a really critical step to managing the process to higher performance. An ineffective standard, of course, is no better than no standard for lead quality. So when you look at that, it puts over half the participants in this study without a useful means to judge lead quality. The value of having a standard is to give everyone the same view of a quality lead. And in the absence of a standard, it's just too easy for marketing and sales to point the finger at each other and use subjective assessments for lead quality that are they're going to differ. They just will. Now let's talk about systems a little bit and see what, what the role is here. Lead quality assessment is made far easier by having systems in place with tools for doing lead scoring and tracking. And you can see in this chart, the orange bars are responses from people who said, we're not using CRM or marketing automation. And the blue bars are from people who said, we are. We're using one of those two systems, one or both. And only 16% of organizations that are using and storing their leads in either CRM or marketing automation 
systems report having no standard for lead quality. So it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare to use these systems and not have a standard. Furthermore, 62% report that their existing standard or definition is moderate to very effective. The contrast with organizations that are not using these systems is pretty sharp, and it really comes as no surprise to us. CRM and marketing automation systems have tools that let us record these lead quality standards we're talking about, lets us score the leads, lets us measure and report compliance. In fact, it makes that almost automatic. So having these systems in place makes enforcing our lead quality standards a whole lot easier to do. And that's just one of the reasons why they're so important. So now let's take a look at costs uh, in terms of budget for lead gen and cost per lead. We've got some data that we collected from our study on this. How much are we spending to do lead gen? And for some organizations, it is the primary marketing activity. Uh, for others, it's just one slice of the total marketing pie. Just over half of this study's participants allocate less than 45% of their marketing budgets to lead gen. Uh, using this study's data, we estimate that the average budget allocation for lead generation is approximately 35%. This is interesting data. I would caution you to use this as a benchmark because everyone is has a different customer journey. They have different things they're selling. Their sales cycle looks different. Um, so if you look at this data and say, wow, we're, we're spending 45% problem. No, not necessarily. Uh, averages, you know, you have to be careful with averages. I, I remember the old saying that if your head is in an oven, if your head's in an oven and your feet are in a freezer on the average, you're comfortable. So we have to understand what averages mean. It's interesting to look at, but but use it with caution, I guess, is my advice here. Now, in terms of cost per lead, the range varies pretty substantially. And the question is really, what is the right number? Well, you're not going to find out by looking at this chart. It's, it's very likely the right number is not the same for everyone. In fact, I'm almost sure it's not. What is useful is to compare cost per lead, or actually even better would be cost per qualified lead across all your lead gen approaches. You want to use this data to produce qualified leads at the lowest possible cost. So uh, we weren't able to go as deep uh, as looking at cost per qualified lead in this study because in previous studies we found out a lot of people don't know what their cost per qualified leads, what that, what that is. But our advice is, is really, if you want to do it, the best way is, is compare based on cost per qualified lead. In terms of budget allocation and cost per lead, just a couple of thoughts. When we looked more closely at this data, uh, it has a lesson for us. These figures do not vary significantly when comparing just the organizations that report moderate, high, or very high lead quality. So the implication is this, or, or in other words, the data from the study is telling us it, it does not lead us to the conclusion that organizations with higher quality leads are paying more to get them. So, so let me repeat that because that, that's a, a little counterintuitive. The data from this study does not lead to the conclusion that organizations with higher quality leads are paying more to get them. So if they're not paying more to get them, what are they doing? And it goes back to something I, I discussed briefly at the beginning of our presentation. It's a quality of execution issue almost every time. So let's look now at measurements in terms of measuring lead gen. And, and before I go too much further, let me just pause here. Uh, I hope the information is helpful and useful. If you have questions, please submit those questions. And in a few minutes, we'll get to those questions. I would love to know what your thoughts are about this as you look at this data and look at your own lead generation situation, what, what you're thinking and what questions you have. So now let's look at the metrics. And we asked in the study, uh, what are you using to measure your lead gen process? And, and lead gen just happens to be one of the most measured processes in the marketing realm. Even for marketing organizations that have not fully embraced analytics for other things they're doing, when it comes to lead generation, most organizations monitor it pretty closely. This chart shows which measures are in use by the people who participated in our study, and we think it's a very representative sample. 
The number of leads, which is at the top of the chart, is just a simple count of the process output. And it is far and away the most popular metric. It also happens to be probably the easiest one to track. And maybe that is the reason why it sits atop this list. Um, question is, <laughs> is, is it the best one? And, and here's what I would say about that. There, there isn't a single metric that tells us everything we want to know in terms of managing the lead gen process. And the most frequently used metric uh, of number of leads, it's appropriate for sure, but my concern is it reveals nothing about lead quality. Just 11% of the participants in our study use a single metric to track their process. And by doing so, they are putting themselves at risk for failing to monitor their process adequately. This process needs metrics to measure both quantity and quality. And, and to do that, you're going to have to have multiple metrics uh, and, and maybe multiple metrics for each category of quantity and quality. Um, we also found out 59% of our study participants used three or more metrics to track the lead generation process. So uh, that's certainly a takeaway. If you're looking at how you measure your lead gen process and you just have one metric, you probably don't have enough to tell you everything you need to know about how it's performing. Uh, let's talk about now the future. What changes are people telling us they intend to make to the lead gen process? And, and what we asked was first tell us what are the most beneficial changes that you could make? How could this process improve? And if you think back to the beginning of our discussion, with only 9% of this study's participants rating their process as highly effective, we have to acknowledge there's room for improvement for most of us. The study survey asked participants to select the three changes from the ones on this list that would produce the greatest benefit. And this chart summarizes the responses that we got. And organizations of all sizes, doesn't matter, large, medium, or small, were unanimous in selecting newer, more creative approaches to lead generation as the change that would produce the greatest benefit. The studies already suggested that lead gen effectiveness is less an issue of which lead generation approach is in use, but more on how that approach is executed. However, there's still value in developing new and creative approaches to lead gen, or I would say even simply using some creativity within the existing approaches. The market almost always rewards creativity, so creativity is always a good thing. We did some more analysis to find out um, to determine if company size had an effect on how these potential changes were prioritized. And what we learned is that new or more creative approaches to lead gen remains the top choice regardless of company size. Uh, what, what is different though is the number two choice. And what is number two in terms of priority? Well, for small companies, they told us that uh, better content was the second priority. Medium-sized companies said greater agility in developing lead gen campaigns was the number two priority. And the large companies ranked marketing automation systems as the number two priority. So kind of interesting to see those differences based on company size. There was an other response option for this question. And it was also useful to look at some of the things people wrote in as responses to the other changes that would most help or help improve this process. And, and you can see them listed here. Lots of things that are process related, that are metrics related, uh, qualification process, formal process and responsibilities, um, things like even culture. The last one listed to me is speaking to the culture of, of trust and belief from the quote traditional field sales team. Uh, so interesting data that we got from these other responses. And again, this is all detailed in the report that we will publish on this. The next thing we did was we asked the question, all right, well, where are you going to invest? In the next 12 months, where will you invest more? To bring about any of the changes we've just discussed, companies are going to have to adjust their level of investment in the things they do to generate leads. So we presented a list of approaches to our study participants and we asked them to tell us where they plan to increase their investment in the next 12 months. And this chart summarizes those results. 
uh, content marketing was the clear winner, number one at the top of our list for increased investment. The content marketing strategy is popping up everywhere, not just lead generation, but certainly it, it has a lot to do with lead gen. If you look at what's number two and number three on this list, email marketing and social media marketing, both of those for success and, and I would say quality of execution depend heavily on quality content. So we see a relationship between those top three things. And, and even content marketing is going to influence things even farther down this list as well. Now, how about less investment? Where are you going to dial it back a little bit in, in the next 12 months? And this graph summarizes those results. And trade show and event marketing looks to take the biggest hit, followed by pay-per-click advertising. And then we asked, I think, what was an important question to provide some context because the data on changes to approaches and investments in, in lead gen um, are useful benchmarks for sure, but they need some context. They need a bigger picture. So what is the overall importance of the lead generation process? Is it growing? Is it on the wane? And we asked study participants to look out ahead over the next 12 months and tell us if the emphasis uh, on lead gen is going to increase or decrease. And you can see the results here. Almost every organization plans to keep the emphasis on lead gen at least at the same level, but most of them say they're going to increase it. And this study finding, I think more than anything else, reveals the mission critical nature of lead gen. So that's a, a fly through of some of the results that we got. Let's jump into some, some conclusions. What does this lead me to conclude when I looked at all this data and did the analysis? Uh, and, and this kind of summarizes things I've mentioned, but let me emphasize them again here. We know that leads are the fuel for the revenue engine, and if a company neglects the process, then you actually could put revenue at risk. So while there are many nuances and variations to the lead gen process, most organizations are doing the same things, but they're having different levels of effectiveness. To improve the performance of the lead gen process, the first area of focus has to be quality of execution. Uh, despite identifying the most sought after change to lead gen as new or more creative approaches, the difference in mediocrity and excellence is execution. New and more creative approaches to lead gen are certainly worth seeking and implementing. While a brilliant new approach may provide a temporary performance surge in this process, it's unlikely to cure long-term lead gen ills. So the place for emphasis is certainly quality of execution. The other main area of focus is process consistency. This involves identifying and tracking a set of metrics that are useful for measuring results and ensuring that all the things in the lead gen process that should happen do in fact happen. An effective definition for lead quality has to exist, as should a system for scoring leads. A nurturing process is also imperative, as are metrics and mechanisms, to make sure we're not letting leads fall through the cracks. The only way to ensure process consistency and, and hence peak performance of this process is through a system such as CRM or marketing automation that helps you define and execute the process with a high degree of precision. The focus on quality of execution and process consistency will produce the best results, but it is not the path of least resistance. Many organizations just want to play a numbers game, and so what they do is they just spend more and more on the same things to try to make up for diminishing results. And, and what effectively that ends up doing is not uh, producing the results they want. It scales up a bad process. And what we really want to do is we want to improve the process, not scale up a bad process. And, and so process improvement requires more effort, but it produces better results. And I think that's what we're all after, is we want better results. So let's talk about what do we do? If we look at this and say, yep, we're kind of in the boat of we need to improve lead generation, what are some things we can do? And we have some resources that will help you with this. I've got four I want to show you. These are all available on the Demand Metric website. If you're one of our members, you can download these for free. If you're not a member, you can sign up for a free membership and get access to some of these tools for free. Uh, so here's, here's two of them. One is our lead generation prioritization tool. 
And there are probably more things we could do to generate leads than we have the ability to do. And so this tool helps us prioritize the ones that should perform the best for us. Then the one listed second is, is probably the place I would start, to be honest, and that is a maturity assessment of the process you have. And this will walk you through the process and, and ask you to answer questions that will sort of score your maturity in a number of areas and it will come back with a score and show you which areas need improvement the most and sort of help you figure out where you can invest in the process improvement. Then two other tools I would put out there are this. After you've done a assessment of your process is develop some objectives. Lead generation is just like any other initiative. We, we can't just say, hey, let's go generate a bunch of leads. Just, just do it. No, we need to have the activity driven by a set of objectives. So this is a tool that lets you put a scorecard in place and define those objectives. And then right below that is a metrics dashboard. And this is a tool that's based, all these tools, by the way, are based on Excel, that you can define, track, and report the lead gen metrics that you've decided are important for you. So, whew, that's that's what I had to say about lead gen, but now I want to know what you have to say. Uh, and I also want to invite the dialogue. Uh, if we're not able to have a conversation through the question and answer, answer console here, uh, I would love to know what you think. Uh, send me an email if you have comments, questions, compliments, or criticisms. My email address is on the screen. Our website is on the screen where you can go get these tools. And in fact, I should say that we have 45 unique resources related to lead generation. So it's certainly a big content area on our website. Uh, or if you want to reach us through social media, I've got our Twitter handle up there as well. So let's, let's go to some questions and see if you all have anything that you have submitted. And uh, just taking a look. Uh, appreciate the comment from one of our attendees that the information was was great and confirms many things. Uh, a question we have here, what are the metrics being used for lead gen? Uh, what we looked at in this study, I'm, I'm going to try and remember from the slide what some of the things are from a metrics perspective that we discussed. Uh, and, and by the way, this is detailed in our report, but but the number one metric was just the sheer number of leads. I, I think maybe the question here is more, what should we be using? Not, not what are people using, because a, a number is fine. Conversion rate's fine. If you are using landing pages and email, click-through rate is fine. Um, ROI falls pretty low on the list, and I think anybody outside the marketing organization always wants to know what return are we getting from investment in this area. I think we need to track cost per qualified lead. A lot of people look at cost per lead. I've mentioned cost per qualified lead, but I think we also have to look at it in the context of the bigger picture that certainly relates to lead gen, and that is what is the estimated cost to acquire a customer? These metrics are a little bit harder to get at, but what I found is when companies really work to understand what the cost to acquire a customer is, they, they suddenly decide they need to have a focus on customer retention that they haven't previously had. And there's a lot of data about customer retention and, and what happens if you're able to retain just 5 to 10% more customers because you put an emphasis on it. And it has a huge effect on profitability. And so when you start doing these things, when you start looking at these metrics, you start to see you, you begin caring about other things you should care about too, like customer retention. Uh, you care about customer lifetime value. And so it really leads you to start tracking things that perhaps you haven't been looking at before. So, so that's a great question. Thanks for that. Uh, another question that has come in is, will we be making this presentation deck available? And the answer is we will, in fact. Uh, we are making a recording of today's presentation as well as a PDF copy of the slides. Anyone who registered for this presentation will get that email message. And I haven't talked to the people responsible for sending it out to know when it will go out, but typically it goes out within a few days of the conclusion of our live presentation. Uh, but if you're concerned you didn't get that email or that you won't get that email, feel free to contact me directly. So let me pause and see if there are any other questions that anyone wants to submit before we end our session together today. And, and here's another one that has come in. 
any tips on getting a clear understanding for cost per customer? We offer an enterprise SaaS product and have a long 9 to 12 month sales cycle. I assume it's 9 to 12 month sales cycle with multiple levels of decision makers. The, the, here's, here's the short answer I can give to that. And, and I would love to be able to follow up and maybe the person who asked this question can, can tell me the answer to my question. Uh, a lot of the way I'd answer this question would depend on the systems in use. Uh, if I'm advising the person who asked this question, the first thing I want to know is, are you using CRM and are you using and or are you using marketing automation? Because many of the things we talk about in terms of metrics are, I don't want to say impossible because that's a bit of hyperbole, but, but they're very difficult to do consistently and with some degree of precision if you don't have the systems in place to do it. And in my opinion, that's part of the value of having these systems. And there's plenty of other reasons to have them as well, but, but I think you have to begin with the systems and make sure that you don't just have the systems in place. We, we have another study where we look at how these systems are being used. And, and what we find is a lot of people tell us they have systems in place, but their implementations of these systems are not complete. So not only do you need CRM and or marketing automation, and we think most organizations need to look at using both because one's primarily a sales tool, one's primarily a marketing tool, but you also should ideally have a high degree of integration. When you do that, then you begin to have the data that you need to figure out what your cost per customer acquisition really is. Outside of that, uh, you're, you're going to be challenged to do anything more than just estimate it. And, and here's the other thing I found is we, we want as marketers to know what this data is, but often we don't have the skills or the tools to go pursue the answer. And, and our advice would be go get the help from outside. We just did a study in December on marketing analytics, marketing and sales analytics tools and approaches. And so I would encourage anyone who really wants to understand this to go look at that study on our website. And, and what we found is that a lot of times marketers need help from people with statistical analysis skills, from da data modeling, data mining skills to go create a model and begin looking at this data. So I, I know that's not a short, simple answer to the question, uh, but I think it's the right answer to the question. And I, I appreciate the person who asked it, putting it out there for us to consider. Uh, okay, we're getting some other questions and we'll go through these as we have time for. Do we have a study on lead nurturing techniques and frequency? And the answer is not yet. Um, that's probably going to be the topic of a future study, but it's not yet on the calendar. Uh, and another question, do you have any examples of creative lead generation? I, I've seen a lot of things that, that are very creative. Uh, and, and the best way I think for me to answer the question is with, uh, some more context because just depending on what the customer set is, who, who the audience is you're trying to reach, what you're trying to reach them with in terms of messages, et cetera, there's a lot of variables. But but with that said, I, I'll give you an example of something I saw work extremely well, and it's a little bit old school, but uh, it was a direct mail piece. And in this digital age, people don't think about direct mail as much as they did anymore, but they they – this particular customer sent out a clear tube as a mailer. So it wasn't a flat postcard. It wasn't a flat envelope. It was a tube that was transparent. They produced a, uh, an insert that was visible through the tube, uh, which, of course, is where the address was printed, but also some really amazing graphics. And then they put something inside the tube that wasn't visible because of the insert, but was obvious when you received the tube and picked it up and held it and shook it, you could tell there's something in there. And it caused the people who received these to open them and do something. And, and while that's not digital, you can certainly put a digital component in. So that's just one example I've seen that I thought was extremely creative. I, I will say this, when it comes to the digital side, uh, I'm gonna point back to another study we did in December. What we've learned in terms of creativity is you, you've got to think sophistication. And, and our study in December on digital marketing and digital experiences said this loud and clear. What's basic, and, and by basic, I mean 
a, a basic landing page that you link to from an email or someplace else uh, just doesn't cut it anymore. Everyone's doing that. So now we're seeing digital experiences that are created using video and content personalization and other things that really wow the customer. So you've got to kind of go big or go home to, to compete with the things being done on the digital side now. So hopefully that is helpful advice. Uh, and then I'm getting uh, a response back to a question earlier about systems and use when it comes to calculating a cost per acquisition. And that particular participant is in fact using both CRM and marketing automation. And so I think that equips you to have the data that you need. And if you want to have more discussion offline, would love to do it. Uh, what possible reconciliation options might you propose when the sales group does not effectively use the CRM in a manner which updates sales? Uh, so that's, that's a, an adoption of the systems issue. That, that is potentially a couple of things. One would be a, a cultural issue. Another would be probably it's a leadership issue. Uh, and I assume that the person who asked this question has done some investigation to understand you know, what's behind the failure to use the system. Uh, I, I got to believe that marketing automation, well, actually, this is a CRM system that's being talked about here. It, it, it could have something to do with the way it's been implemented. Uh, it's Often, this is a result of what we call a forced march, that CRM was forced down the throat of the sales team. And sales people being what they are in terms of, of fairly autonomous in terms of the way they like to work, don't usually respond well to that. I'm speculating here, but I've, I've seen that often is the reason why. When you implement a CRM system, there has to be lots of collaboration with the sales team to get them to use it. Uh, and, and if there is, that is the best path to ensure that it gets used. But it doesn't guarantee it. The other thing I think is very helpful is to ensure there's integration with CRM and other systems, certainly marketing automation, but potentially other systems. CRM can integrate with all kinds of systems, uh, order processing and, and, and accounting systems and other types of things. And I think that when you start to achieve that high degree of integration with other systems, the, the interest in adopting and using the system on part of the sales team tends to improve. That's been my experience. And uh, here, here's a comment. Uh, you have to begin with the systems and make sure that you don't just have the systems in place. Implementations of systems must be complete. Uh, you need CRM and marketing automation. Also should ideally have a high degree of integration. When you do that, you begin to have the data to figure out what your cost for acquisition is. I appreciate the comment I, and I couldn't have said it better myself. And uh, another comment. Uh, oh, okay, okay, I think I'm, I'm just getting some corrections on some things. So I, I think I've run through all the questions, but thanks so much for all of them and for your comments. Uh, I'm going to let everyone get back to work now, but again, thanks for attending and participating today in our session. And if you have other comments that you wish to share, uh, please let me know. We're very interested in doing what we can to help you. So if there's something we can do, please contact me. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Goodbye.